Okay, I'd like to call the meeting to order. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. In accordance with the Open Public Meetings Act, PL 1975, Chapter 231, adequate notice of this regular meeting of the Board of Adjustment of the Township of Franklin has been provided. Board members, applicant, professional, professionals, and members of the public, please speak directly into microphones so that our recording secretary can properly process minutes. Applicants and professionals, please fill out the sheet on the table when you've completed your testimony. Thank you. Uh, would you please call the roll? Carol Vithia. Richard Prokanik. Here. Joel Reese. Here. Alan Rich. Here. Gary Rosenthal. Here. Robert Shepard. Here. Uh, both Vasim Verdas and Elizabeth Clarkin asked to be excused this evening. Robert Thomas. Here. Minutes, regular meeting, April 7th. I'll second. Rich Prokanik? Yes. Uh, wait, Joel, you can't move. You didn't. Okay. I'll move. Okay, so Rich is first and Gary will be second then. Okay. Uh, Rich Prokanik? Yes. Gary Rosenthal? Yes. Robert Shepard? Yes. And Chairman Thomas? Yes. Uh, resolutions, they're not on the final agenda, right? Okay, just there were no resolutions. Just making sure, yeah. okay. Discussion, extension of time, mats and construction. ZBA. Mr. Matson's here, and uh, I believe you're being, yeah, he should be here. Uh, Mr. Thomas, he's being represented by attorney, but that's Mr. Matson right there. Okay. This is ZBA 180019. Uh, while they're setting up, uh, Live Devco, ZBA 210011, uh, D use variances preliminary and major, final major site plan height variance in which the applicant seeks to develop a three-story apartment building at 2 Hawthorne Drive, Somerset, Block 194, Lots 127 and 128 in the HBD zones carried to July 7th with no further notification needed. And we should be able now to move to extension of time. Let the record show that Sharabithi is here at 731. Good evening, Mr. Chairman, members of the board. Peter Lamford appearing on behalf of the applicant. Uh, this request is for an extension of time for uh, Maureen Matson. This application was approved in 2019, uh, and part of the application and the condition of approval was that we have a sewer connection with Southbound Brook. Uh, this property is in the vicinity of the border of Southbound Brook. There is or there was an agreement uh, between Franklin Township and Southbound Brook regarding sewer service, which agreement expired and was uh, had lapsed and the township and Southbound Brook were negotiating a new agreement. And until that agreement was negotiated, we could not get a sewer connection in Southbound Brook. Uh, they finally resolved their issues earlier this year. Uh, I have a letter from Southbound Brook now saying that we can tie in to the sewer in Southbound Brook, which was a condition of this board. Uh, as the board is aware, the a variance is good for a year. Obviously, it's been more than a year. And also, the municipal land use law gives the board the right to grant extensions if it's something that's beyond the control of the applicant. Uh, so, But doesn't the extension have to be granted before the, the, the original approval expires? Not, not, not in this case, because we didn't know. We did not know when we would be able to come in and request the extension, because if we were never able to get a connection, we couldn't do the project. So we, we are now requesting the extension so that we can apply for the building permit and start construction. And we would request an extension of six months to do that. Uh, and we will start constru construction well before then. But otherwise, if we came back with every year, 
uh, we, all we tell you is we're negotiating, but under the municipal land use law, you have a right to, if it's an outside agency that's holding you up to request an extension after uh, the condition, the open condition has been resolved. If Thank you were doing nothing, we'd have to come back and ask for an extension. Right. Okay, anybody need any more information? How about it, uh, a, a motion to grant an extension to November 1st, 2022, will that work? That's fine. Right. Is there a second? Second. Any questions? Who first it? For this? An public. Is this the public? I didn't think we opened not to the public. Not for an extension. No. In an abundance of caution, I notice, but but it is not a public. We just had one last night. The extensions yeah. are not public. No, it's there's there. Correct. There's no reason to open it to the public. It's right. just a request for an extension. Uh, it seems as if Mr. Landfried, as he indicated, provided notice, which is not required by. By municipal land use law. Okay. okay. Any other questions? If if not, uh, we have a motion. Okay. Who first and seconded? I didn't. Hear. I I seconded. You second, Bob. And who first it, please? I think Mr. Thomas. I I made the motion that we grant okay. the extension to November first. Right. Okay. Twenty twenty two. Okay. Thank you, Cheryl Bethia. Yes. Richard Profanic. Yes. Joel Reese. Yes. Alan Rich. Yes. Gary Rosenthal? Yes. Robert Shepard? Yes. And Chairman Thomas? Yes. Okay, King Kingsley Sackey, ZBA 2100015, a C variance in which the applicant seeks to build a 20 by 20 covered pavilion in their side yard at 1465 <laughs> Easton Avenue, Somerset, Block 466, Lot 9 in the R40 zone. Oh, do you want to give us a yeah, I mean, I, I think the, the description pretty much says it. I mean, this is a residential property on uh, Easton Avenue. You can see in the report that was provided from the Technical Review Committee um, the location of the property um, and its shape. You'll see that it's uh, a very uh, it's very shallow in depth, uh, even where the house is, and then it gets progressively more shallow uh, in a uh, triangular shape. Uh, the applicant had started constructing a um, a pavilion, covered pavilion, uh, I guess for their own recreational use, uh, and due to the shape of that property, uh, it didn't meet certain setbacks. The required setback is uh, 55 feet. Um, the existing house, and basically everything on that property is not conforming, again, due to the, the shape. Um, but 55 feet is required. Um, the pavilion's 25 feet from the front yard, or the front yard setback. And the rear yard is 25 feet, and they're at 11 feet. Is the is the house also at 25 feet, or is this coming still closer to the to the road? Uh, looking at the survey, uh, the survey says indicates that the house is 25 feet. Okay, all right. So it's not any closer. It's going to be lined up as if. Yeah, that's what, that, that's what their plan is showing. The 25 okay. feet is the house, and the pavilion's 25 feet. All right. Okay, I thought there was some discussion in oh. the uh, paperwork about the size of it. Is that How big is it going to be? Yeah. So, good evening. So, the, the pavilion is actually going to be well, well, Wait a second. Before you wait. Start, can you raise your right hand? You swear any testimony you're about to give me the truth, the whole truth, and nothing? Yes. For the record, please give us your name. Sure. Kingsley Saki. Thank you. You're on. Go ahead. Okay. Um, so the pavilion is going to be 12 by 20. Okay. And I think they also mentioned something about squaring it up with the house. Is that something we're concerned about? At this point, or uh, well, that's what Mr. Shepard just asked about. I, I believe what, what was the setback relative to the yep. house, um, and he just indicated that, or the plan. I, I indicated that the plans show that it's 25 feet, and that's the same setback as the house, 25 feet. Okay, that would make sense. Any other questions? No. 
anybody uh, need any more information? I, I, one question for the applicant. I understand you went before the, the Township Historic Commission. That's correct. Um, can you just briefly describe what was the nature of their review? Did they make you uh, make any modifications to it, and have you um, incorporated that into your proposal? Sure. So the initial plan was to build a 20 by 20 pavilion. That was what was presented. The uh, commission had concerns about the size of the uh, pavilion, and that's why it was reduced to 12 by 20. So there was an original uh, plan, and I started construction for the 20 by 20, so that adjustment is going to be made. And that's the plan that I uh, submitted, a 12 by 20. OK. Any other comments or questions? Well, now, we, we, now um, you just said 12 by 20, but I thought before you said 10 by 20. No, he said 12 by 20. 20. OK, I'm yeah. sorry. Okay, sorry about that. Now we will open to the public if anyone has any questions or comments. And we will close to the public. Uh, just, Mr. Chairman, just for clarification, I, the Historic Preservation Advisory Commission's comments uh, were then there was included, and it indicates that the gazebo should be reduced to 16 by 20. Right. So the additional adjustments were made to 12 by 20 because they were concerned about the height. And so to get it in conformance with the proposal or the recommendation, we have to reduce to a 12 by 20. Okay. So what you're asking for is a 12, 12 by 20. Correct. If there's no other discussion or comments, we'll entertain a motion. Um, I move that we grant uh, uh, Kingsley Sackley um, a, uh, a variance to build a, um, a pavilion uh, to be sized at 12 by 20 on his uh, property located at 1465 Eastern Avenue, Block 466, Lot 9. I'll second. Cheryl Bethia? Yes. Richard Prokanik? Yes. Joel Reese? Yes. Alan Rich? Yes. Gary Rosenthal? Yes. Robert Shepard? Yes. Chairman Thomas? Yes. Okay, good luck with it. Thank you. Thank you, board. Next on the agenda, Side Data Mandir Incorporated ZBA 190037, uh, D3 conditional use variance, C variances, and site plan, in which the applicant wants to construct a 28,616 square foot place of worship at 583 South Middlebush Road. Lot 36.01, Lot 6.03 in the agricultural zone carried from May 5th. No further notification needed. And maybe you could just give us a heads up to where we left off at this point. I would be happy to, Mr. Chairman. Good evening, uh, Mr. Chairman, members of the board. Peter Lanford appearing on behalf of the applicant. Uh, at your May meeting, this matter, uh, proceeded and we presented the testimony of two witnesses. Uh, those witnesses are Mr. Shevra Kula, uh, who is one of the members of the congregation uh, who testified as to the history of the, uh, the religion, the fact that they have an existing facility in Edison and that this is going to be a second facility for them here in Franklin Township to service the Franklin Township community. Uh, he went through the hours of operation and how the, uh, the temple would work and why the, the temple looks the way it was proposed. Uh, we also had the architect testify and he uh, presented exhibits showing the colored renderings in, of the elevations and also the floor plan and also testified concerning the occupancy of the temple. So that's where we were at the, at the end of the last meeting. Uh, I have three witnesses to call this evening if we can get to them, and we will try. I intend to call my site engineer and then uh, my traffic consultant and ultimately my planner to justify. There are two variances that involve the conditional use standards. Uh, those variances, which I think this board is pretty familiar with, having heard a few of these applications, uh, is a buffer variance in that we are not providing a triple row of uh, evergreens and a fence around the property. We will give you justification of why we're not doing that. 
the other is that the majority of the parking under the conditional use standards is supposed to be in the back of the building. Uh, we will give you a justification why we did not do that. The only other variance is for the frontage where we have a small deficiency in the lot frontage, which will be testified to by the engineer. Okay, I also want to add the, uh, in addition to the witnesses you presented last time, uh, we also took questions from the public from for each witness, so that will not ordinarily be opened again. Uh, yeah, I, I did indicate that there were some members that were not here at the last meeting, and I think we ought to get a confirmation as to, since there's only seven members here, as to either everybody was here at the last meeting or everybody viewed the, uh, uh, the uh, video of the hearing so that they can uh, act on this matter. I, I watched the video. I did too. Okay. And I did too. Okay. All right. So everyone up here should be <clears throat> eligible, correct? Okay. Okay, go, on. go ahead. All right. Who is going to be the one who uh, is going to testify about the, the buffering uh, issue? The Will that be your engineer? Yes. All right, good. Yeah. Okay. So with, with that, uh, I will call my site engineer, Mr. Patel. you raise your right hand, Mr. Patel? Do you swear the testimony about to give will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? Yes, I do. Thank you. And for the record, just your name. J.S. Patel, J-A-Y-E-S-H, last name Patel, P-A-T-E-L. I'm employed uh, with uh, Crest Engineering. I'm a professional uh, pro engineer and a professional planner in the state of New Jersey. And can you give the board the benefit of your educational and professional background? Yes, uh, I have a B.S. in civil engineering, uh, graduated in uh, 1983, uh, and uh, since 1997, I've been employed by Crest Engineering, and uh, as a professional engineer, I have prepared this plan. And you did say licensed. Licensed. Okay, uh, okay we, we can go on. Yeah. Okay, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, Mr. Patel, uh, you prepared the site plan, which is the subject of this application? That is correct. And uh, if we can bring it up on the screen, uh, I think you're going to have uh, four sheets that you will rely upon in presenting your testimony? That is correct. And in order to help the members of the board, did, we, did you uh, make reduced versions so that we can hand them out to board members? Yes. Okay. Um, I have I have them as a package of, of four sheets uh, that were prepared by uh, Mr. Patel. I th and they're stapled together. I guess we can mark them as one exhibit. Yeah, it's good. Mr. Patel, can you uh, describe the subject property and also the surrounding land uses? And first of all, before you go, you indicated you are a 
licensed professional engineer and professional planner. You're only presenting engineering testimony this evening. Is that, that correct? That is correct. Okay. All right. So this project site plot 6.03, block 3601, uh, is located along the western side of the uh, south middle bus road uh, with its, uh, south, its intersection with the uh, Checks Road uh, on the northerly side. Um, site is uh, uh, approximately 24.83 acres, and uh, it's bounded north and south uh, by the preserve agricultural land, on the west by a farm stand, and on the um, uh, easterly side across the south middle bus road, and at active agricultural uh, land. Uh, in the past, the site is believed to have been used for the lead comp uh, compost processing. Uh, and uh, presently, the site is undeveloped. As you can see, uh, the site is shown here with a yellow border. There's a bright dust line is shown 500 feet radius. Uh, Pardon me, what about the 500 foot radius? It's just uh, showing the location of uh, where the 500 feet surrounding comes, you know. Okay, just so you could figure out where to serve people? But we, so we only have to serve within 200 feet. Before. Right. The, yeah, the notice is needs to be per 200 okay. feet. You All know. right. Yeah. So what's the importance of the 500 feet? Uh, nothing. It's just... Uh, okay. Yeah, All right. There's no significance for 500. Uh, the overall topography is from the South Middle Bus Road um, going uh, down on the westerly side. Uh, and there's a, the, the topography uh, drops into the two different locations. One is going towards the northerly side to this uh, north corner, and the uh, portion of the site drops down towards the southwesterly corner. Uh, where there's a natural depression. And in the past, the lead composting process uh, operator had created uh, a, a, a constructed an outlet structure which just uh, uh, for the, to filter out the uh, sediment as well as the uh, lead compost or debris. Pardon me, it's just locking out. Now, with respect to the property right now, the, the, the center of the property uh, is basically scrub growth with some vegetation. Is that correct? That is correct. Uh, and uh, can you describe the perimeter of the property today? Yes. The perimeter, as you can see, there are uh, the scattered uh, hedgerows uh, along the, uh, the perimeter, and uh, which thins out in a certain location, and it's uh, uh, continues uh, all along the property. Okay. Now, also in your, in your initial statement, you indicated that there was some preserved farmland adjacent to this property. That is correct. Which properties are preserved? This particular piece of property is preserved. Okay. Below is uh, this suddenly over here. This portion is also preserved. And, okay. and who who owns those pieces of property? Uh, believe the, uh, I'm not sure the... They're private owned, private privately owned, owned, owned they're farmland property. preserved. Okay. I think you want to know the exact name? I do. <laughs> Bob, what was the question? Who owns the piece of property, the farm, the preserved farmland on either side? Uh, I think I, if, of on page six of, of my report, um, it's colorized. What's in green is um, state open space. So what that's showing is to uh, the property to the north, that is, uh, that's part of the six mile run state property. It must be, they must have a tenant farmer perhaps yeah. that's farming it. That's, that's the old reservoir? Yeah, so? that's, state, yeah. that's state open space. Uh, property to the, to the rear appears to be privately owned. And then along the southerly boundary, um, I guess maybe the rear two-thirds is state open space, and then the front one-third is uh, private land. Okay. Thank you. As well as two properties um, 
uh, in front of the property between it and South Middlebush. Now, Mr. Patel, uh, can you move on to the next exhibit to uh, show the board the site plan? Sure. And for the record, this is a colorized version of the site plan, which was part of the plan set that was submitted in conjunction with this application. That is correct. Okay. Um, and can you basically describe, as a, first of all, there's one access point to the subject property. Is that correct? That is right. And that's on South Mulpish Road? Yep. The proposed uh, site access is to the this proposed driveway from the South Middle Bus Road. Okay, and how far is the building from South Middle Bush Road? So the building is about 500 plus feet, 500 and uh, um, I believe it's uh, 500. Uh, <laughs> I mean, the, the site line is shown is about 580 feet from this particular location. Okay. Uh, that is to the building. Okay. And the building and the exhibit that's before for the board is in an orange color? Yes. The, uh, the building is in orange color. Okay. And the building is, is oriented uh, with its narrower side towards South Melbush Road? That is correct. And is there a reason why we oriented the building in that manner? Yeah, since the, the South Melbush Road is a scenic corridor, township designated scenic corridor, uh, it just, uh, in order for the building to be viewed in a, a smallest uh, possible uh, view, uh, it was, located so that it's facing to east as the narrowest uh, path or the narrowest width uh, uh, that can be viewed from the South Middle Bus Road. And, and because we decided to, in essence, minimize the view of the building uh, from South Middle Bush Road, then we had to put the parking on the side of the building, is that correct? That is right. And if we were to flip the building so that it was running parallel to South Middle Bush Road, we could have put the parking behind the building at that point in time in compliance with the conditional use standards. Yes, we could have done that. Okay, but it was in looking at the scenic corridor and trying to minimize the visibility of the building, mm -hmm. uh, the applicant and yourself and the architect felt it was most appropriate, again, to put the smallest side of the building towards South Middle Bush Road and the parking uh, alongside the side of the building. Right, that is correct. And as was testified to at the previous hearing by Mr. Joshi, the main entrance to the House of Worship is on that uh, northerly side of the property, correct? You're right. That Wait, what? Northerly, which side is northerly? The top, uh, the, as you so can the, see, the north area, the north is the So access the to the building is, is from the side closest to the parking lot? Right. Correct. That okay. is from the center of the building. This is where the main access is. Okay. Okay. And, and in addition, the other consideration, uh, there are, as uh, you testified to and as Mr. Haley referenced, there are two single-family residential dwellings uh, adjacent to your property along South Middle Bush Road. That is correct. And we, in, in order to, again, minimize the impact upon them, the orientation of the parking is furthest away from the residential dwellings. Is that correct? Yep, that is correct. And as testified to by Mr. Joshi, uh, and in the, the design that the board is looking at this evening, there's a walkway around the building in, in a brownish color. Is that Accurate. That is the emergency access. Yes. Right, so, and there is really no activity that is contemplated uh, to take place on the subway side of the property. That is correct. And I know you have it marked on the, on the exhibit, but can you indicate what the distance is from the corner of the building uh, 
closest to the residences to the residents the nearest residence on South Millbush Road. Yeah, the, the distance from the corner of the building to the uh, corner of the house is 420 feet approximately. Okay. Now, in this exhibit that's before the board this evening, there's a lot of green stuff around the property. Is, is that a f accurate representation of the hedgerows and trees that currently exist around the property? It is a mix of the existing uh, um, uh, trees, slopes, vegetation. Okay. And, and in order to comply with the uh, ordinance involving uh, houses of worship, in, in order to provide a buffer pursuant to the ordinance, it would result in us having to remove part of that existing buffer to plant new trees and a fence, correct? Yep. The, and and the, the vegetation around the perimeter of the property is fairly mature, in your opinion, and, uh, and fairly it, dense? It is, it is uh, fairly mature, mature, but particularly from the um, south middle bush road, it is uh, dense, and uh, as you can see, there are s locations in thin south, but particularly in the south middle bush road, it's just uh, scattered. Uh, Okay. Vegetation. Now, and is our intent to preserve all of that, those existing hedgerows and vegetation? As much as possible, yeah. except where the driveway. the driveway is proposed to be constructed. In addition to the existing vegetation, are there any plantings that are also proposed to further screen the building from South Middle Bush Road and also to provide some screening and buffering from the adjoining property owners. Yes, as you can see, the colored uh, cir circular uh, shapes of uh, the landscaping shown on this plan, uh, which are proposed landscaping, um, as you can see along the proposed driveway on both sides, the landscaping is proposed in the uh, areas along the south middle bus road, as well as from this residence uh, where there are gaps and things like that, uh, additional landscaping is proposed. Furthermore, on the back of the building, on both sides of the proposed uh, emergency access driveway, uh, the landscaping is proposed. Also, is uh, shown in the parking lot uh, within the uh, a, a, around the perimeter, as well as within the islands. Uh, additional landscaping is proposed as well as the, uh, on the northerly side, where the building near the foundation, additional landscaping is proposed in the shrubs and uh, okay. um, small uh, ground covers and things like that. Can you briefly describe to the board how stormwater management is going to be handled with respect to this project? But before you go on, I do have one, one question about what he was just talking about. W what types of trees are you going to be installing in addition to what is already there? Are, are those going to be deciduous trees or conifers? There are, there are mix. Uh, there are evergreens, there are deciduous, uh, and uh, some uh, so it's, uh, uh, I can show you, uh, okay. The, if you look at his page, uh, page uh, the landscape plan on the package, I don't know if you brought it with you, the, the big set, uh, there is a landscape plan, and I think there is somewhere a legend of all the yeah. trees. So that is on the page after the landscape plan. Yeah. It's about 97 evergreen plants, 167 state trees are proposed. It's and much easier when he just answers the question. You're okay? Okay. Uh, can, can you address how stormwater management is being handled? Yes, so the stormwater is provided in a form of uh, there is an infiltration basin which has a sand bottom and it overtops through the spillway into the proposed wet basin. 
uh, which will discharge into this uh, existing uh, wetlands area, which will further have a, its uh, attenuation and will discharge through this existing outlet structure into the existing discharge point. So that the red, the red uh, thing on the plan between the evergreens is an existing outlet structure. It's an existing outlet structure is shown in a small square just before going into that red rectangle, which is a stone outfall. Okay, and it's a riprap apron. And when you say it is a wet basin, does that mean it will have water all the time? Correct. Okay, and has the stormwater management plan been reviewed by DRCC? It has been reviewed by DRCC. Also, it has been reviewed by the state. Okay. Uh, are there any environmental constraints on this property? Yeah. Uh, there are, you know, particularly this uh, lens, I mean, uh, wetlands area, which has been delineated, approved by the state. And for this particular plan, the permit required uh, for this uh, stormwater outfall from the wet uh, basin has been secured also. It's been secured. And are we disturbing any of the wetlands as part of this application? Yes, uh, it's a, the portion of the, the, the outfall which is going to be uh, disturbed, you know, uh, has been uh, permitted by the uh, permit. Okay. So. Just to summarize, the, there's a wet basin. Any overflow from that wet basin will go into that outfall structure into the existing wetlands, and all of that has already been reviewed and been permitted. Correct. OK, thank you. Um, can you indicate to the board what kind of lighting we are proposing in conjunction with this application? Yes, so uh, there are uh, the, the, as far as the lighting, the, uh, into the uh, Parking lot, uh, there are lights proposed which are, uh, one second. It's, a, it's LED lights of 4000K uh, style. 29 lights are proposed or within the parking lot as well as the driveway. And then there are, uh, those are 15 feet high pole mounted lights. Um, there are eight fixtures on the building are proposed for um, security, lighting, and, uh, you know. And uh, in discussing this matter with the applicant, obviously the lights will only be illuminated in the parking lot when there are functions going on in the evening. And if once the functions are done, uh, there will be no lights illuminating the parking lot, and only security lights will remain on, correct? That is correct. Uh, how is refuse being handled? The refuse has been uh, to be handled by the private hauler. There is a, uh, it's not seen over here because of the landscaping, but there is a, a uh, proposed uh, refuse dress and closure is provided in this particular corner of the parking lot. Thank you. Um, now, how many parking spaces are we proposing? That the, there are yep okay so the, uh, there are 196 parking spaces are required we are proposing uh, uh, 201 parking spaces including eight handicapped spaces okay and, and then when this plan started uh, th this application has been sitting for a couple of years because there was another application pending before this board. Uh, there were no requirements for EV charging stations. Uh, now, uh, because of state legislation, there is a requirement for EV charging stations. Is that correct? That is correct. And you will modify the plans to provide for the EV charging stations on this site plan? Yes, I will do that. Um, now, can you briefly, I sort of talked about the variance for the parking on the uh, side of the property. Uh, with respect to the frontage, what is the zone requirement for the frontage? The zone requirement for the frontage is 
uh, 400 feet, while we have the 357.92 feet around the uh, South Middle Bus Road, which is an existing non-confirming condition. Okay, that's an existing condition. Now, uh, as you know, we've had numerous discussions about the scenic corridor and the visibility, or trying to minimize the visibility of this house of worship from the scenic corridor. Is that correct? That is correct. And did you prepare an exhibit, uh, which is your next slide, to show the board uh, what would be seen uh, from South Middle Bush Road to the House of Worship? Yes. As you can see from this exhibit, uh, for this display, the car is shown on the South Middle Bus Road, um, heading towards the southerly direction. If you are looking at the building, uh, this is the view which is shown in a section. The South, the car which is shown here in the right side corner, bottom corner, South Middle Bus Road. Uh, the red test line is shown is the sight line from the car to the highest point of the building. Uh, and as you see, there are existing uh, proposed trees, there are some existing uh, uh, trees and uh, bushes and shrubs are there. Uh, as you keep on going towards the building, the furthermore additional proposed landscaping is uh, showing there. And uh, as you go to the building, uh, the building which is the dome is at 51.4 feet is shown there. And from the driveway, the, the driveway is not straight into the property, it's angled, is it not? That is correct, and in order to avoid the direct view to the building, it has been um, um, made with the perpendicular coming to from the South Middle Bus Road, but it is actually turning to, to right, northerly direction, and heading to the uh, so, proposed parking. So if someone were to just look down the driveway as they were driving by, they would see the driveway, but they would not see the building? That is correct. Also, the angle of while you are driving, it will be very hard to look back and try to look at the building. Your view will be, at 45 will be the most, you know, if you try to see on the side, you know. Okay, and, and you have finally one last exhibit which shows some of the street views from South Millbush Road and also from Jake's Lane of the subject property. Yes, sir. have to just do this. So in this exhibit, as you can see, the, the site is shown again, same with the uh, yellow borderline. This is South Middle Bus Road, and here's the Jack's Lane. Uh, you see the numbers 1, 2, 3, 4, and 5 are the Google Street View location where these uh, pictures are taken. And one and two, as you can see, that uh, there is an existing vegetation which is closest to the Jack's Lane, uh, which is, you know, uh, it, it is apparent that it's very hard to see anything, you know, beyond that. Uh, uh, similarly, if you look at number three, four, and five, which is now on the along the South Middle Bus Road, um, 
this particular view is number three is right is that you approach this side uh, is that driveway is right there uh, that exists which becomes the stone area access is right here number four is past the driveway all these evergreen shrubs you know which is uh, pretty you know dense and uh, uh, tall uh, it's apparent that it's very hard to see through anything beyond that point uh, and uh, the last one as you approach the existing uh, driveway to the neighbor uh, again at that location also there is a uh, heavy vegetation and, and it is our intent to maintain all of that vegetation other than what's necessary to uh, construct the driveway right. into the site uh, and also to provide adequate sight distance for correct. cars entering and exiting the property. Right. And is there a proposed sign at that driveway entrance? There is a proposed sign at the driveway. Okay, and the proposed sign is a conforming sign with the township ordinance? That is right. And it will be externally illuminated, is that correct? It is externally and uh, that, that sign will be right at, it will meet all of the setback requirements also. Correct. Thank you. Now, have you had an opportunity to review the staff reports that were generated in conjunction with this application? Yes, I did. Okay, and can we comply with all of the staff reports uh, and I'll, I'll just go through them very quickly. Actually, the police department says we satisfied all of their comments. Uh, the engineering report uh, from CME, which was dated, if I can find September 2nd, 2020. We can comply with we everything they're in. The and Mr. Healy's report, which is also it's it's August 14th, 2020. Right. And uh, other than having to prove certain things, which we'll do through yes, testimony, things. Right. Uh, I think your, your testimony dealt with how we dealt with the landscaping, clearing, parking location, buffers, so we've addressed everything. Right. And would the applicant be willing to, uh, once the, uh, the house of worship is constructed if some supplemental plannings may be necessary to again screen the facility from south middlebush road or from the neighbors as best as possible agree to provide some additional uh supplemental plannings yes we can work with the uh, township staff professionals uh, where there are gaps so uh, we can provide additional landscaping uh, this can be agreed upon and uh, you know, necessary. Okay, and if we make all the changes that were requested by CME, which were minor engineering changes, do they substantially alter what the board is looking at this evening? No, it will not alter substantially. Thank you, I have no further questions. I just have a question, going back to the driveway. Yeah. Uh, I know you have to provide a site triangle coming out of it, but that, <clears throat> That uh, there's a pretty wide existing opening through that vegetation. Is it going to be necessary to really widen it substantially further in order to get the driveway? Because you, you've, your property, the interior of that property is invisible Correct. In, 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 from the front. And you've got an opening because I believe that was once the potential leaf composting uh, facility for the township, and it actually was wide enough for trucks to go in and out of. So uh, I, you're not going to have to really expand that too much, are you? No, actually the location is totally different. The existing driveway, which is falling um, somewhere in here, uh, which is right near the property line 
and uh, it is coming through, as you see, the, the opening between the uh, green spaces, you know, that's where the existing stone driveway is. You know. So what we are proposing is that... So, so uh, this will be a new driveway? A new driveway in the middle of the, the frontage, so that way, uh, if there is a, a slowdown stacking or anything that can be possible to um, make the turning moments, you know, rather than having cars backed up towards the Jacks Lane intersection. Okay. Thank you. I have a question about the buffering. So I see the different trees, but a lot of them aren't green. So I'm just wondering year round, how well is that screening going to be maintained? Well, again, you know, these are mix of evergreens and, you know, the uh, deciduous trees, but mostly the hedge grows is uh, the evergreen set. So they're going to be uh, pretty much all year around will be, you know, screening the, the site, uh, particular the building, visibility of the building. And as I said before, uh, once, you know, uh, you know, the under the building is in the construction, or as you know, we come to uh, if the the engineering staff uh, feels that there are additional landscaping is required, or there are gaps, we agree to provide additional evergreens, deciduous trees, whatever is agreed upon. Before the before the leaf composting, was it farmland? I I believe the I, I'm not sure about uh, before uh, leaf composting. I I believe it was. Yeah, I, I would say it doesn't look like you're actually removing a single tree from the property because there's nothing 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 significant. Uh, right. Correct. Correct. They are like secondary growth, and slowly it's becoming, you know, um, clumped together and becoming a mass, you know, and things like that. But no significant trees exist there. Any more board questions? The, the uh, <clears throat> I think you said something about like the retention basin was going to have water in it all the time? Yeah, this one will have the water all the time. And you're going to have a fence around the whole thing, correct? Well, you know, we have not proposed the fence because this is, it's like, the, this is particularly close to 1,000 feet away from the uh, You're going to have children there though, right? Uh, we'll have the children. Uh, we're going to add pants, uh, need to you know, discuss with our client and uh, we'll, you know, s s see if, uh, you know, it's feasible. Mr. Rich, I, I've done some houses of worship and there's issues with having a fence and not having a fence. Uh, sometimes when something is fenced, it becomes more of an attractive nuisance uh, to for kids. And also, if somebody gets in there and, and there's a fence and you need to get in there to get somebody out, it may make it more difficult. Uh, I mean, we could put it in, but yeah. we don't, you know, I'm not saying a fence should be there. I'm not saying a fence shouldn't be there. There's, there's counter arguments to it. Uh, but it's also at the back of the property, significantly away from uh, the entrance to the house of worship and even a significant distance from the parking lot and if you recall the testimony at the last meeting there's really no outside activities that go on in this site so when families come to the property they go right into the building to <coughs> worship so nothing goes on <coughs> I have a qu question that relates to all this how deep is the water going to be in this uh, retention oh, okay. basin? So as per the state's uh, requirement, they require f four to six feet. This is falling into that six feet deep. Four, uh, it's going to be four to six, six feet deep? Yeah, because this is a permanent pump for the water quality and the state requirements. Uh, it's That's what we have designed for meeting the state requirements. State has reviewed, DRCC has reviewed, and they have approved the plan with the state stormwater design. Uh -huh. Okay. That was a different answer than I was thinking I was going to get, but uh, 
All right. If you're comfortable with no fence and four to six feet of water, knock yourself out. But you'll be putting the agitator in, right? Yeah. You can put the Edison device, you know. Any other questions? <clears throat> Just uh, two questions, Mr. Chairman. Uh, so just to clarify, the light green on the exhibit um, that's shown as lawn, is that also, with the exception of the septic field, it looks like that's also your limit of disturbance? That is right. Yep. Okay. And then beyond that, it says existing meadow grasses. Um, what's the long-term plan for that area? Is it going to be maintained as grasses, or is it going to be allowed to grow? Uh, no, they, they will be maintained and most likely so that way it, it just like, you know, stays in a natural state but not to grow to the whatever the height, you know. So at least, you know, if you need to, you know, say something in the sense that uh, people can, you know, if, if, if you need to like, you know, go out there like say for the septic system maintenance and things like that, go out further down to see this uh, wetlands area or any other portion of the site. Uh, it's walkable condition, you know. Okay, so that what I'm thinking, what I think uh, I'm hearing then is what's in light green is going to be like manicured it's a, lawn. It's a manicured lawn, lawn, lawn. That's going to be mowed, mowed, you know, on a continuous basis. And, correct. And the rest would be it's just a, it's a few whatever. times during the season. Correct. Right. Okay. Yeah, it will go higher than your regular loan, you know. Kind of maintaining its existing... Right. Okay. Yeah. All right, thank you. Anything else? Yeah, I do have... I just want to yeah. go over um, lighting. Yes. Um, there's going to be... Um, they're all going to be uh, focused with downward lighting. That is right. And the... Um, they will be turned off at any time that there's no, um, nothing going on. If there are no site and activities, correct. Now, what about the, the um, I want to call it a rotunda, but that's not the right word. Um, the, the dome, that's what I, yeah. what, when is that going to be, that's going to be lit? It's been, uh, Discussing the we discussed that at the last meeting. We were going to we were going to have it on uh, all the time that something was going on. But in, in deference to the neighbors, we indicated when we have our special services yes. or on a weekend, we would light the dome and again turn it off when services are over during the weekday. Uh, we will not have it on. Okay, good, good answer. Thank you. Okay, anything else? And just one more thing, Mr. Chairman. I, I think the uh, suggestion made by the applicant to have um, the ability to evaluate the gaps and fill in those gaps, I think, is a good suggestion. Um, I, I think they should offer some form of proposal of order of magnitude. You know, yeah. uh, 25 trees, 50 trees, some, you know, some some type of order of magnitude that staff can use. Um, because with it, the, if there's no guidance, then if we ask for 100 and they tell us two, so I think as staff, I would appreciate some guidance and direction from the board on that. At the appropriate time. Any thoughts on that? I, I, I thought that judging from the size of the property, 50 trees doesn't sound like it's an, an outlandish number to work with, but um, do you think that that's enough, Mark? Well, what I would suggest is, is I would suggest we just keep that out there. Uh, we are going to hear from the public, and at some point, whether it's tonight or, no, or another night, you'll make, somebody will make a motion. So you yeah. might want to have the discussion at that point after you've heard all the comments. Okay. Okay, if there's no other are no other questions, then this would be the time to open to the public. Thank you, everyone. Uh, anyone who wishes to ask this witness's, witness questions based on his testimony, this would be the time to do that. Good evening. Go ahead. Good evening. Thank you. I'm Martina Bailey. I represent Ray and John Snyder. Um, they are the residents immediately south and southwest of the site. Um, so they own the, the residential properties that are most impacted by this development. Um, and thank you for the chance to, uh, to ask some questions. Um, 
this is a helpful exhibit showing the, the um, foliage and the buffering. C could you just clarify the green that we're seeing along that southern property line, which is the property line adjacent? Right in here. That, that, that property line and the, the, the southwest property line, that's right. I, is that mostly trees, or is it? They are um, mixed. There's uh, shrubs, trees, and uh, all vegetation there. And, and how, how much buffering does that currently provide? in your view? I mean, particularly in this area, it, it provides significant. We have gone to the site and taken some, you know, walk and looked towards the house. It's, it's pretty mu much you can see, you know, um, the building or beyond this vegetation. It's very hard to see. So I, I would be beg to differ. I, I've seen photographs from my clients property, mm -hmm. neighboring property, it's very patchy. There are some trees um, right. that are quite top heavy, yeah. and there are some areas where there's a straight line of visibility. Right. As I said, you know, when you look at from this side, I'm not sure from here it can be different based on the topography and other features, you know. We, we would ask whether the applicant is willing to work with the neighbors in coming up with uh, additional landscaping, supplemental landscaping for that particular area, and so far as it affects <coughs> their property, it, my, my clients, you know, are not trying to give this applicant a hard time. They um, they they would like additional screening. Um, their requests would be reasonable. This is a request that I've already presented to Mr. Lanfred, and in so far as they're directly impacted by this development. Um, they would ask just to be able to weigh in or at least see a revised landscape plan. Uh, I, I think what we've offered is to have the township get involved to look at to make sure we screen. Now, I just want to make it clear. The, the ordinance says that South Middlebush Road is a scenic corridor, and we have done whatever we think is appropriate and significant to screen this facility from South Middle Bush Road. Regarding their residences, we will try to provide screening, but there's, th their ordinance says we have to provide a triple row of evergreen trees. That's all we have to provide. We do not have to completely screen this facility from the residences, but I think the answer is we will work with the township to try to provide as much screening as possible from those residences. And I would rather rely, you know, and nothing against Ms. Bailey or Ms. Mr. Snyder, but I think it's probably better that if they want to communicate with the township and work with us, that's fine. But I don't. I think it's better if we work through the township. Well, I well I, and, and let me make a suggestion, which is uh, I think you know, it's typical for the the board is going to impose conditions. Staff is responsible for enforcing that condition. There's nothing stopping staff from communicating with the affected property owners and seeking their input, and I'd be happy to do that. Would you be willing to make that a condition of the of the approval? Well, I mean, that's up to the board. I and mean, if they, I mean, if you want to direct me to seek their input, I certainly can do that. Uh, at the end of the day, again, I, I don't think it's. I think it'd be proper that staff would have to make that final determination um, of what is sufficient. Um, but again, seeking the input of the, of the neighbors, they are the ones affected. So what is the most effective placement of trees? Uh, where are the gaps and wh where might be, you know, placing a tree five foot in one direction or the other may have a big impact. Um, so understanding, you know, getting an impact from the neighbors, I think would frankly help staff make that determination. So again, I'd be happy to meet with them. I think he's made the offer to reach out to you, so it's on, incumbent on your client then to. We we understand that it's it's the municipal that the township staff that ultimately would make a decision, but I, I think it makes eminently good sense uh, for the neighbors to have some amount of input or at least to be. Uh, yeah, and and, and we didn't say we objected to that. We have no problem. With it. I I think there needs to be a chain of command and a chain of discussion. So I think it really needs to be through the township staff. And, and obviously, I think the real answer is you, you're not going to get an idea of what you need until that building is up. And once that building is up and the shrubs that we show on the plan are in, then we can figure out what else needs to be put in. Uh, to, to look at it today is, is not going to give you an answer.
Right. Well, I, I appreciate that. Um, and we would hope to see a condition that at least acknowledges that the neighbors will be part of the process. The ultimate decision can be, can be the, the townships, obviously. Um, one other question about the buffering. Now, you, you've provided a, a, a sight line kind of um, um, visual for, from South Middlebush Road directly sort of perpendicular from the, the, the building. But if you go a little bit further north, and I think maybe one of your prior slides um, would illustrate this. If you go a little bit further north on South Middlebush, and if you were traveling, if you're traveling that south, would be the, in the uh, site plan, a little bit further north, just just it's, just where the intersection of, of Jacques Lane. Yeah, it's not shown on uh, this particular display. So if you go back to where you just were, I think right that, in that other side display. That one. Yep, right. that one. Okay. Mm -hmm. And now, outside of your 500-foot dotted line there, there's a small stretch of, of South Middlebush where there's virtually no buffering and where it, it, it's reasonable to assume that a, a car traveling south would have a, a view of you the structure. You are talking about this particular yes. area? Yeah, that's the structure. Remember, when you are traveling this way, there is this particular... Uh, hedgerow will provide the buffer, you know. Additionally, the landscaping within the, at the perimeter parking lot as well as close to building will also further provide, uh, as well as the proposed driveway has trees on the both sides and things like that. So it's, it's, it's just not seen on here, but imagine if you, the, the site is constructed, trees are installed, you know, you will see the, the additional landscaping will provide the difference, you know. Is, is it your testimony that, that you wouldn't be able to see the structure from that portion of South Middlebush? Yes. By the time all the landscaping and everything is done, you should not be able to. It will be a filter, you know, filter view. Uh, it's, it's, you know, will be somebody has to stop the car and look at then yes, you will be able to see. If you are traveling, you know, you are driving, and you will have the filter view, you won't be able to notice, because it's, it's a 500 plus feet away, and in between there are scattered trees, vegetation of all kinds, including the, you know, evergreen shrubs, you know, will provide the fil filter view. But you're not providing any additional buffering, are you? on that north? No, but then the, the, within the gaps and things like that, what we have shown on the landscaping, you know, that's what we are providing. Yeah. You know. and, and that other parcel is not our property, so we can't provide any landscaping or yeah, buffering. So and it's yeah, actually state-preserved uh, farmland. Right. If I could interrupt. so. I think the comment that Ms. Bailey is making is, frankly, one of the comments, one of the thoughts that I had in mind in terms of adjusting some of this screening. I mean, when you look at this exhibit, at least from this exhibit, it looks like it's pretty dense in here. All right. But when it gets in this middle section, kind of back in here, at least from your exhibit, it looks like it might be a little spotty. Yeah, they, and now you're mentioning gaps. Right. Yeah. And I think this is that angle from South Middlebush that conceivably Looking across that field, you may have some views yeah, and some, you know, well, you know, good placement of, of additional right, landscaping right. may fill that gap. Yeah. One thing on that particular, that does not display, but there is an existing bomb over there, existing bomb, land, you know, the bomb, you know, that past operation or whatever they have done, this they had created some soil staged over there, and it has created, like, you know, some kind of a bomb. So it stays there. So it is, even though the vegetation may not be there, but there is a bomb that will provide, you know, additional, you know, the obstruction. Okay. Sorry, Ms. Bailey. Thanks. Just, just a couple more follow-up questions, Mr. Patel. Um, just going back to the lighting, and I just want to be t completely clear. Um, 
we, we appreciate the concession to the neighbors with respect to the lighting of the yeah. dome. And just to be clear, the dome lighting itself will be shut off after the events for which it will be eliminated. Is that, yeah. is that correct? That, that's what we indicated at the last meeting. Okay. That's correct. Yeah. And so that would be special events and weekends? And weekends. Yeah. Okay. Yep. And the special events being the two or three times a year that were testified to by Mr. Sherbert so. Yeah. Right. And the security lighting that will continue after the um, the other lighting is shut off. Is that does that around the building that the building? door locations and exits uh, so what the architect uh, yes, has provided? Why, man? We have to have this security light and what not. Understood. Um, just. I, just a couple of, sorry, did you have something? Go ahead. I had just a couple of uh, follow-up questions on the, the township reports. There was, um, there was a, a report from the um, Somerset County Department of Health and Safety that had indicated that the septic design um, had been um, deemed incomplete. Um, what, could you comment on that? And, and yeah, that it just needed to be. Uh, they we submitted the septic system plan, and uh, there are uh, some questions regarding the use of the building areas, like what's the you know uh, the prayer hall, what's the warm um, up kitchen, you know, and things like that. And so we we have not yet provided the response, but that's what it is. It's a couple of minor comments that they have, and. Uh, um, architect and myself will reach out to them to provide the adequate response. Okay, so that hasn't been approved yet? It's not approved. Okay, what's the size of the, the, the tank, the septic tank? Do you know? Uh, right now, I don't have the plan. I probably would say about uh, 1,500 gallons, something like that. Uh, but again, you know, that's, I'm going from my memory, you know, just. Uh, um, just a quick question on the, the um, CME report um, dated September 2nd, 2020, um, which Mr. Lanford had, had indicated that you'd complied with, but there was a paragraph 14, and I'll just read it for the benefit of the board, where it says, it is, it is expected that the seasonal high water elevation in the surrounding vicinity of the wet pond will raise to the permanent water elevation, making the infiltration basin non-compliant. Uh, Right. And, and the, the applicant's engineer should further review this. Issue. Yeah, but so one thing that uh, what we have shown on this particular uh, the design of the wet basin, uh, we will need the liner, and liner has been proposed. So what liner will do is stop the water going towards the infiltration basin. So that will actually, you know provide the adequate response, you know. And by liner, you mean a, a sort of a filter? Not or the regular filter. It is the, like, HDP uh, liner, you know. Right, right. Yeah. Um, I, I was recently made aware of some emergency DEP regulations with respect to stormwater management. Um, this is very new, so it, it, right. it's being digested. Are you aware of that, and w uh, can you testify that that doesn't affect the, <coughs> the stormwater management plan? This particular has been, this plan has been approved, or the permit has been secured. The emergency uh, uh, stormwater and the FHA regulation that you are talking about is is for the new sites, new applications that the DEP will be reviewing. Thank you. Um, just a, a quick question on parking. Well, you indicated 196 parking spaces is, is what's required, but you're actually providing two, 201 spaces. Why the additional spaces? I mean, it's just that when we try to play out the parking lot, that's what it came out to be close to slightly exceeding the number of required okay. parking. And you're not banking any of those parking spaces? Um, no, but not at this point. We have not planned to bank the parking. Um, so question about the, the location, again, going back to the driveway, and um, this relates to buffering as well. Um, am I right that the driveway, the location of the driveway was actually shifted from what's there currently or what was there previously? So it's a little bit further south than than the original driveway. 
the original driveway, you mean the existing driveway? The, the, exist, uh, the existing or previous driveway. The existing, the previous, the, that driveway is right in here, and it's coming this way towards the side. Uh, this particular proposed driveway is in the center, as I described before, you know, so that it provides adequate, you know, the stacking distance, you know, for the cars turning left and right, you know. So was that more of a safety measure to, to, to relocate? Yeah, I mean, it's, it's, yeah, particularly, yeah, safety as well as just, uh, you know, so that it also, uh, the, is also, we discussed before, if the driver was here, you are falling in the line of the building, now that will open up the visibility of the building by providing the driver here, actually it provides the screening. Would, would the applicant consider um, just relocating or redesigning the driveway ever so slightly so that there's a curve, in which case you could actually provide more buffering f and more screening of the building from South Middlebush? In other words, keep where, it, where it enters from South Middlebush and then it curves a little bit more so that you can have an additional um, buffering I think he testified that, that if you look up the driveway, you don't see the building. If you look up the driveway, if anything, you're going to see the driveway going towards the parking lot. The building is not visible from the driveway. Right. Okay. <coughs> One second. Thank you. I have nothing further at this point. Okay, thank you. Anyone else out there would like to ask any questions? Okay, we'll close to the public and move to the next witness. Okay, what's what's the time out here? All right, we'll adjourn five minutes. We probably all need it.
trucks to cars be a lot different, a lot easier. <clears throat> Oh, I guess we have to go home. Never mind. We got it. <laughs> we have all the board members. You raise your right hand. You swear testimony about to give will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? I do. Thank you. Can you state your full name for the record, please? Rihanna Kirchhoff. And by whom are you employed? Dolan and Dean Consulting Engineers. And you're an expert in traffic engineering? Yes, I am. And you were qualified last, last night. Nothing changed. <laughs> she was qualified last night before the planning board, so uh, we will present her testimony this evening. Uh, your, your firm prepared a traffic report in conjunction with this matter dated November 5th, 2019. Correct? Correct. And that was pre-pandemic. Correct. So the traffic on South Middle Bush Road and, and the numbers you have are all pre-pandemic numbers. That is correct. Okay. Can you indicate to the board basically uh, what the traffic con conditions are on South Middle Bush Road? And then also I want you to uh, testify as to the sight distances from the new driveway and visibility. Um, so. Obviously, pre-pandemic volumes were significantly higher than they are now. Um, during an evening peak hour, you're looking at 1,800 vehicles on South Middle Bush Road. That's a two-way volume, uh, predominantly with the southbound movement having approximately 1,200 vehicles. So in terms of how we prepared our traffic study, we looked at trip generation for three different scenarios um, and how we decided trip generation accessing the site was based off of the maximum occupancy of the building. So based off of the architectural plans and the, um, and the occupancy schedule, there is a maximum occupancy of 587 people on, that could be accommodated in the building. Um, we used the average vehicle occupancy of three people per vehicle, which is consistent with the township parking calculation. And that would yield 196 cars that would enter the site and exit the site. Um, so these three scenarios look at the Thursday night service, which is the anticipated peak activity for a week. Um, service is anticipated to begin pro approximately between 7 o'clock p.m. and 8 o'clock p.m. So we assume that the 196 vehicles would access the site within that hour. And then conversely, when services end... Wait, wait, within what hour? 7 o'clock p.m. to 8 o'clock p.m. Okay, so the, but the, I thought you said the service started at 7. Um, the, the, the testimony was that they're rolling services. So in other words, the facility is open at 7. People come in between 7 and... Okay, so, all right, all right. Sorry. No, it's okay. That was testified to at the last hearing. I know. I, I, I watched that. Exciting, wasn't it? No. Mm -hmm. It was brutal. <laughs> so we anticipate within that hour that a majority of the vehicles would be entering vehicles and minimum number of vehicles would be exiting. Everyone's coming in at that point. Um, when service ends, roughly around 9 o'clock to 10 o'clock, you're going to have people filtering out. So, you know, um, we would anticipate the 196 vehicles leaving within that hour. We conducted capacity analyses for the driveway intersection along Middle Bush Road. And what we found um, was that with this maximum occupancy, 196 vehicles entering and exiting the site, uh, the egress would operate at level of service D or better. So um, level of service D would occur if we had a minimal amount of traffic leaving the site between 7 and 8, it would be level of service uh, D. But when you have the 196 vehicles leaving at the later hour, you have a better level of service because you have less, less traffic on South Middle Bush Road. And what level of service is that? Level of service C. Okay. 
at 17.9 seconds of delay. So um, just to reiterate, the estimated trip generation is based on the maximum occupancy yielding an analysis of the worst case scenario. Um, as previously testified to, they don't anticipate 587 individuals in the building at one time. The other scenarios that you looked at? The third scenario that we looked at was a Thursday evening um, during the peak hour on Middle Bush Road, which occurs between 5 o'clock and 6 o'clock in the evening. And as I stated earlier, that's approximately when there's 1,800 vehicles on South Middle Bush Road. So during that time, we anticipated approximately 30 vehicles would be entering, um, assuming that they're coming home from work and they're stopping by to do their evening prayer. Uh, we anticipated that not a lot of people would be leaving during that time. However, because of the high volume on Middle Bush Road, our analysis indicated that the driveway would operate at level of service E, which is 46.3 seconds of delay, which indicates that there's not a lot of uh, available gaps in traffic for cars to exit at a peak period. Um, but obviously, when services are more uh, intensive and when more vehicles are anticipated to access the site, the vehicles on South Middle Bush Road and the volume is significantly less. So, so I guess my question has to do with the driveway, because it would seem to me that even if there's a lot of cars on South Middle Bush Road coming out of that driveway and turning right, uh, which would be going that would be going south, um, that would be a lot easier to get out of the driveway than if you were at that particular time of day trying to make a left-hand turn to go north. So my question is, is what does the driveway, what's the plan for the driveway? Is there going to be two exit lanes or is it just one exit lane so that somebody who wants to turn right but is behind two people who want to turn left uh, is going to grow old waiting to be able to turn right. I believe at this point we are proposing a single egress lane at the driveway. We haven't entertained the idea of uh, a separate left turn, right turn lane at the intersection. And that speaks a little bit to safety. When you have a, a left turn lane and a right turn lane, you could have a left turn vehicle sitting in that left turn lane and the right turn vehicle is trying to inch out and see through that left turning vehicle. It creates a safety issue, creates a sight line issue. So we're more comfortable with a single lane and having everyone generally wait until they're the first car in queue. Okay. Now what happens what happens to somebody who's coming south is that correct? No. Somebody who's coming north on South Middle Bush Lane and uh, South Middle Bush Road and wants to turn into that driveway, what kind of a queue are they going to be creating? So we looked at the left turn lanes into the site from a delay standpoint. It's a level of service B. You're looking about 10 to 12 seconds maximum. Um, in terms of queuing, that is based on our analysis. Let me just get to that page. You're looking at less than one vehicle queue. So they had, you know, essentially they're waiting for a gap in one direction of traffic, which they're getting enough to make the left turn safely and efficiently. And, and at what time? Is that the 6 o'clock time or is that the 7 o'clock time? That's the 7 o'clock time. What about the 6 o'clock time? The 6 o'clock time Similar, it's, it's less than one vehicle at a 12 second delay, so they're still getting the necessary gap in traffic in order to turn left. And how did you come up with that, that information? Does that come from the book that uh, the traffic engineers put out, or is that based on observation? Um, that is based off of the highway capacity manual and software that Your we, book? Yes. Yeah, okay. In addition, we did, you know, speaking of left turn lanes, we did have this conversation with the county and discuss this, um, you know, the potential or the need for a left turn lane, and the county concurred that one is not necessary at this time. I, I have, I, I have, I have a, a question. The, mm -hmm. the, 
The book is nice, but if you were ever on that road doing six o'clock the rush hour, I don't know how anyone can can, can make make a, a left turn without waiting about five or ten minutes out of, the, out of that driveway. But based on my real observation of dri driving on that road, now wouldn't it be more practical to to, to do to, to do a live obs observation rather than just use a textbook for for, for this testimony? I I, I would say that, but there's no driveway for us to observe at this moment with an active site. Well, well, well then the te textbook is fine uh, on some, some other highway, but but it's not accurate on on, uh, on South Middlebush Road. That uh, during during six o'clock rush hour, uh, it's really tough. Mr. Reese, yeah. you, you've been on it too, haven't you? And I, and I can answer that it, it isn't that tough, and the reason is that that road is is jammed. And, and therefore, traffic is moving very, very slowly, and, and most of the traffic in the evening is going south. And so people that are going north, people will let them make the left turn in. It's not like people are going down that road at 40 miles an hour at 6 o'clock in, in the evening. I've gone down, down that road on numerous occasions, and you're going 5 miles an hour, 10 miles an hour. So there's ample opportunity to make a left turn because somebody will let you make the left turn while you're waiting while they're waiting to proceed down the road. But pro providing people are nice enough to let you make the turn. There, there, there are enough people in this world that are nice enough to make you let you make the left turn. Uh, I used to, m many, many moons ago, live on Jake's Lane myself and had to make that left turn. Uh, so I'm aware of that. Uh, oh, I'm sorry. Uh, did you analyze the the driveway for site visibility for vehicles exiting and what what this what their visibility is so that they can clearly make either the left or right hand turn from that site? Yes, uh, we reviewed the uh, site plan for um, site distance requirements and consistent with Ashto, a site triangle of. 450 feet is provided, which is in excess of the minimum site distance required by AASHTO, which is 425 feet. Uh, there are no obstructions that would uh, hinder drivers from being able to efficiently and safely exit the site. Now, also, you're aware, and obviously Ms. Dolan is aware because she testified in the application for the other temple, uh, that there is another temple that has been approved not too far from this site, uh, and the county has asked that your office review uh, both sites in conjunction with each other. Is that correct? That is correct. And Ms. Dolan has provided information to the county in for their analysis, not only of this site, but also of the other site. That is correct. Okay. And we are still waiting for the county to finally sign off on it. but. The county is reviewing this so that they're looking at both properties. Well, did we get a copy of, of, of that communication between the county and uh, Ms. Dolan? I don't know that, Mr. Shepard. I, I know there was a verbal request. Uh, I know the county issued a letter in 2000. Let's see if I can find it. Now you're testing me. Initial review of this application was in February 2020 uh, by Somerset County, and that was a letter which the township did get a copy of. And then there were subsequent communications when the other facility was being proposed where they asked for combined analysis. I, I don't have a letter to that effect, but I know they asked for it, and I know Ms. Dolan provided it. And I can get that information so it's in the township file if you want it. Okay.
Bob, is your mic on? All of the projections you made are based on the worst case scenario with the highest possible attendance and people on site, which is, if I'm not mistaken, contrary to the testimony offered by uh, Mr. Shevakola as to how the temple or the mosque institution will actually operate. So we're hearing the worst of the situation. The second thing, when you say it's a uh, level of service D or E, you're uh, referring to that time delay that's only borne by the people in line coming out of the temple. So it has no effect on the traffic on South Meadowbush Road, correct? That is correct. I right, just wanted to make that. And the other thing, just to refresh the board's recollection from the last meeting, there are times when we have the high holy days where we do anticipate a above average attendance, and we had agreed that, as with other temples, uh, we would meet with the township uh, in advance of those events. And if the township requires that a police officer be there to direct traffic, we will provide that. And we would agree to that as a condition of approval. Okay, thank you. Uh, is that it? I have nothing further of this one. Anybody else? Mark? Open to the public. Here's your chance to question the traffic. Good evening. Martina Bailey again for uh, Ray and John Snowden. I'm sorry, I didn't catch your name. Rihanna Kirchhoff. Co Kirchhoff. Yes. Um, good evening. Um, the determination not to have a left turn lane. Um, that was a county determination, was it? That's correct. Um, because I have, I think, the letter that Mr. Lanford just referred to dated 2020, in which, in which that was still an open issue. Um, does the county make the determination based on the same worst case scenario or on actual numbers as presented? They make the determination based on volumes on the roadway. Volumes on the roadway, but, but they're looking at projected Correct. traffic into the site as well, yes. and do they use They use the, the same volumes scenario? that we presented in our report to assess whether or not the left turn lane would be required as part of this application. But you, you can't confirm if that was the, the maximum, the worst case scenario, or if it was the projected number? It is the worst case scenario as out, outlined in our report. Okay, the, the figures that are attached to um, your report, and this is dated November 5th, 2019, um, specifically figure, figure one and figure two, uh, just help me understand those, those diagrams, do, the, do those indicate in the numbers um, next to those arrows, are those the numbers of, of actual cars or is that something else? Those numbers indicate actual cars. Actual cars. So th those are based on projected attendance. Correct. Um, because some, something that jumped out at me was that the, for whatever reason, the data that, that was used in terms of actual projection of attendance when this report was done was significantly lower than um, the testimony we've, we've heard in this, um, at this hearing, which is that attendance would be more like two, 20 to 30 devotees on a weekday, 40 to 50, and up to 120 to 200 on Thursday peak hours. Um, g given those increased numbers, does that ch would that change um, the analysis as far as figures two and three? Uh, my testimony is consistent with the figures shown in uh, figures two and three. So we're basing our uh, trip generation on the maximum uh, building occupancy, which is 587 people, assumed with a um, average vehicle occupancy of three people per vehicle, you're coming up with 196 vehicles. So uh, that middle section in on figure three, where you have 98 cars making a right turn in, 98 cars making a left turn in, you come up with that total of 196 consistently um, for the the uh, volume figure indicating when they would leave um, Thursday night services. You have 98 vehicles making a left out, 98 vehicles making a right out, totaling 196 vehicles as projected. 
Okay, and the, t and the top figure here, which has 15 going in and 15, looks like 15 going in. So the, 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 30, uh, the 30 vehicle projection was us assuming that a certain percentage of people would show up during the peak times for the roadway. So uh, going to worship on the way home from work, for example. So we made a general assumption based on the information provided to us regarding um, evening attendance on a typical work day uh, of roughly 30 vehicles attending, um, accessing the site at that time. So that wasn't based on the projection of actual no, attendance? No, that was based on um, anticipated operations for a typical day. Right. So if you're always using the, the worst case scenario, which is based on mac maximum occupancy, what, what relevance does actual any sort of projection of actual attendance um, really mean? Is it relevant at all? Uh, we, we wanted to present a, a conservative analysis, worst case scenario. Obviously, these volumes are also based in 2019, uh, pre-COVID. So you're looking at a very conservative outlook on what this driveway would operate like in the future. And so you, you didn't feel that there needed to be a revision of this analysis based on the fact that, you know, nearly three years have gone by since it was, uh, it the, was written. The board's professionals didn't request any type of revision or new traffic count, so we did not provide any. Okay. Um, the, the, other, um, the other piece of information that's also come to light, which wasn't in this report, was that um, that there actually is going to be some overlap between the two sites on the weekend, which which wasn't assumption I think that was in the traffic analysis that you provided. Um, and while you testified that you took into account the the Dada Bagwan site traffic, that didn't acknowledge, at least not in the report, that there would be overlap on the weekend. Um, is that something that you, you can you comment on that at this point? Um, I did not testify in uh, regarding the other site located down the street. I don't have any experience with that one in particular. And, and Martina, and just so you know, M Ms. Dolan did, who testified in the other application, did provide to the county, like I said, combined numbers of both sites. And, and Sunday is the only time where there is for a short period of time, an overlap between while the two sites are operating simultaneously. Uh, the rest of the time, there is no uh, real overlap. But uh, th that information has been provided to the county. I had understood from Mr. Shivakula's testimony that there would be services on Saturdays as well. Was I wrong about that? Uh, hang on. I think he indicated 8 a.m. to 9.30 on a, on a Saturday with attendance of 100 to 120. And then on Sunday, 8 a.m. to 9.30 with attendance of slightly higher, 150 to 200. And if that, Sunday is the overlap day, the higher number should, should cause, I think, a little bit more concern. And, and, and again, we, we provided that to the county to see if they re would require anything. And if, if they feel there are any modifications out there, Obviously, they have the jurisdiction over that road, not this board or the township. Right. Uh, right. But yes, you're correct. There, there are some Saturdays that uh, we will be having activities also. And um, are you able to provide any more color on, on what, um, what the basis of the, the county's conclusion was that no left turn lane is, is required? <laughs> It would be from my conversations with Ms. Dolan, who said that they looked at both sites and based on the volumes of traffic and that there is minimal activity during peak hours. Uh, in other words, either traffic is generated from these sites on Saturday and or Sunday or later in the evening, and the one site obviously is only on Saturdays and Sundays, uh, they did not feel that a left turn would be necessary. Right, and I, I'm assuming that they had the same information that we have, which is that there is actually a significant overlap in terms of the hours of attendance for both of the temples. They, they have all of the information that was provided to this board f as far as hours of operation from both houses of worship. Okay, if I, 
I don't believe that, that that information is posted, but if that could be made publicly available, we, we would appreciate that. I will see if I can get that from Ms. Ms. Stalin and have it provided to the township. I, I would point out that there, there, are, there is a significant point of view, not just the one that Mr. Rice um, shared, but my clients feel that, that the reality is that there is already a lot of congestion during peak hour and that the traffic um, congestion will get significantly worse um, when you have not just one, but two of these temples operating within a few hundred feet of each other. Well, if you recollect, Ms. Bailey, the other temple does not operate at all during any peak hours because it's not open Mondays through Fridays. So that temple does not have any effect on peak hour. And as indicated uh, by Rihanna, uh, obviously, this temple has some activities during peak hour, uh, but they are minimal in nature, and then the rest of the activities are after peak hour, starting at 7 p.m. So, will there be a little bit more traffic? Yeah. Anything that's, whether you're building a house on South Middle Bush Road or doing anything else on South Middle Bush Road will create more traffic. Sure. Given some of the concerns, would you consider would you agree to a condition that you would review the traffic after a year or two of operation? It, it doesn't work that way. Once it's approved, it's approved and... It, and it can certainly be a condition of approval and I've seen it, it done it's, many times. It's strictly a county decision and, and, uh, and it, the county doesn't feel it's necessary, then it, it, won't, it, it won't have to be put in. <coughs> Well, the, ca the county wouldn't feel it's necessary if then, if, you know... If, if, if we are uh, asking questions, right? I, yeah, I think it's a reasonable condition when there's a con concern over um, what the traffic pattern will actually look like once both temples are operating. It doesn't hurt to have a condition to periodically review. Look, and if I, the, it's, it's a county road. The county approves, you know, the traffic as to the road. It's not this board's prerogative to do that. So even if they impose the condition, it's, it's valueless. Fair enough. I have nothing further. Anyone else wish to ask any questions? We'll close and let's get to the planner, correct? We will get to the planner. If he's not worn out from last night. Last night was last night. He talked about trucks, so we'll stay away from that again tonight. You swear the testimony about the guilt be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. I do. State your name for the record, Mr. O'Brien. My name is Kevin O'Brien. I'm a licensed professional planner. My uh, business address is Shamrock Enterprises, Madison House, Suite B, Madison Avenue in Rawley, New Jersey. Okay, unless something drastically changed in the last 24 hours, he should be fine. Mr. Dominic did not refer any matters to the Board <laughs> of State Planners, so I'm in good shape tonight. <laughs> okay. Closer. Mr. Mr. O'Brien, uh, you... Uh, viewed, you were not here at the, at the last hearing, you, but you did view and hear all of the testimony of the witnesses at the initial hearing in this matter, correct? To uh, quote Mr. Shepard uh, brutally, yes. <laughs> and obviously sat here and listened to the testimony this evening of, of the witnesses. You're also familiar with the master plan and the zoning ordinance of the Township of Franklin, are you not? I am. Okay. And we are here for basically one C variance in conjunction with this application and we are also asking for two deviations from the conditional use standards, correct? Uh, unless there's a change, I understood that there were two C variances, one for uh, lot frontage and one for parking aisle width. Oh, I'm sorry, I, I, we missed that one. Okay. Uh, please, rather than start, let me asking you questions, review the variances and the justifications for the variances. Certainly. So we're here tonight for site plan approval, as you know, uh, and a D3 conditional use approval for a conforming house of worship. A house of worship is considered to be an inherently beneficial use. The D3 conditional use variance is different from what you're used to when there's a D1 
which is a use that's not allowed in the zone. Uh, to use the classic example, somebody wants to put a gas station in the middle of a residential zone. That's a classic D1 use, something that's not allowed, period. D3 means that it's allowed. The master plan allows it. The zoning ordinance allows it. The township council has thought about it and put it in the ordinance. But it has to meet a number of conditions. So in our particular case, there are a couple of conditions that we don't meet, which means that it's before you for your approval. Otherwise, it would be for, before the planning board for site plan approval. The parking location requires a conditional, um, is part of the conditional use requirements. And the parking location is required to be behind a building. And that is typically done in order to shield the view of the building from the, uh, the view of the parking, excuse me, from the street and create a much better looking site. In this case, we're placing some of the parking along the side of the building, but not forward of the line of the building. Um, uh, you've already seen the pictures of the site plan. The intent of the ordinance is basically to shield the view of the parking from the street. I think it's been demonstrated through testimony that there will not be a view of the parking from the street. And in fact, once you get to the driveway, you've got to turn your head all the way around and look behind you to look up the chute of the driveway in order to see any of the parking. And you're not going to see the building because that is going to be shielded and buffered by the existing and augmented buffering. Uh, so I believe that this does meet the intent of the ordinance in terms of the required buffer, which is also allowed, also a condition, um, part of the conditional use approval. The applicant is relying on the existing hedgerows, which you've seen, as well as augmenting that landscaping where required. There has been discussion this evening about working with the township on where that augmented landscaping can go, and I believe that everybody said that they were willing to do that. So those two pieces of the conditional use variance have essentially been met in that the parking location meets the intent by shielding that parking from the street and buffering, even though we're not providing all the buffering on our, we're not providing new buffering, we're using the old existing buffering and augmenting it to do the same thing. The two C variances, one is lot frontage, 400 feet is required, and 357.92 is existing and proposed. This is a shortfall of 42 feet, or 10%, which is, I think, a very small deviation. Parking aisle width, 26 feet are required, 25 feet are proposed. I believe this is a de minimis exception of 0.03%. This also reduces the impervious coverage which has a positive impact upon the application, uh, particularly in the agricultural zone. We don't need to pave more than we need to. Uh, most vehicles will be cars. Uh, this is not a truck parking lot. We've got trucks in there somewhere. So the cars are going to be able to fit within that 25-foot um, parking aisle width. But Mr. Mr. O'Brien, do you know why they they chose to make the aisles 25 feet instead of 26 feet. I mean, you've come up with some possible reasons that they might have done it, but has anyone told you, like for example, the, um, the architect who was here or the engineer, did they tell you we made it 25 feet to save money or we made it 25 feet for some other reason? I have not been given a reason as to why. We could certainly ask the site engineer. My understanding uh, as a planner was that it was done to reduce impervious. But we can certainly ask the engineer. Let's ask him. Sure. Yes, the, the parking guides were uh, provided 25 feet. Uh, it's also the reason of reducing the uh, slight pavement area. At the same time, 25 feet is mostly like most of the towns we have worked with are accepted in the sense that it works, you know. So additional one feet not providing any additional factor of uh, 
you know, safety or turning movement or anything. So that's the okay. reason. Okay, thanks. Thank you. There are some uh, parts of the master plan that discuss community facilities. In fact, the 2006 master plan has the following goal on page one of the community facilities element. Provide adequate community services and facilities to serve the needs of all current and future residents of the township. Continue to provide adequate services to fit the needs of the township and continue to evaluate the adequacy of existing facilities. And this application does meet those goals by providing a place of worship, which is an inherently beneficial use here in the state of New Jersey. This application is also supported by the municipal land use law in a number of places where the goals of planning are listed in section 40 colon 55D-2. Among them are item A, to encourage municipal action to guide the appropriate use or development of all lands in this state in a manner which will promote the public health, safety, morals, and general welfare. Item B, to secure safety from fire and other disasters. Item G, to provide sufficient space in appropriate locations for a variety of uses to meet the needs of all New Jersey citizens. And last, to promote a desirable visual environment, and I believe that this application does support those goals by providing a use that serves the public health, safety, morals, and general welfare, by providing an inherently beneficial house of worship. A new fully code compliant building will be placed at this site, which means that the uppermost safety will be ensured. The religious needs of New Jersey citizens are satisfied by this application, and a desirable visual environment is maintained and protected by this application placing all development over 200 feet away from the scenic roadway. And as you may recall, the phrase inherently beneficial use is one that is used in the municipal land use law because it's something that is considered of universal value to the community. I just have two quick questions then, Mr. O'Brien, uh, regarding the D3. Uh, if we were to flip the building to run it parallel to uh, South Middle Bush Road and put the parking behind the building as required by the conditional use standards, does that run afoul or in conflict with the scenic corridor ordinance? And based on the scenic corridor ordinance is what we are proposing the most effective use of the parking? On the one hand, if the building uh, were turned to be, be turned towards South Middlebush and the parking behind it, we would meet the ordinance requirement. But I don't believe that we would meet the intent of the scenic corridor ordinance. And the scenic corridor ordinance is the one that talks about main maintaining that corridor and its visual appeal and making sure that there's no intrusion upon that corridor. And by maintaining the corridor as it is and turning the building in such a way that it will not be visible from the corridor, also ensuring that the parking is not visible from the corridor. So I believe that this does meet the intent of the scenic corridor ordinance. The second part of the D3 that you testified to talks about uh, the buffering around the site. And in order to comply with the ordinance, we would have to take out existing vegetation in order to put in the, the staggered rows of evergreens. Uh, is there any, from a planning perspective, is there any logic to removing vegetation in order to plant newer vegetation, probably not to the same thickness and density than what is there now? No. Thank you. I have no further questions. Any board questions? Yes, I have uh, several. Uh, your, your emphatic no um, uh, doesn't really uh, address the what the quality of the the vegetation is. Um, it would seem to me that if uh, the vegetation is um, uh, inferior in some way, uh, then uh, it would make sense to uh, replace the the inferior vegetation with um, uh, something that was uh, better. Now. I have an, um, another question. Well, I wanted Should you to I, re I wanted you to reply to that. Okay, sure. Uh, I, I made an emphatic no, and I was probably being a little flip. I should have gone on, but um, 
you've got the existing hedgerows, the existing vegetation, and it just doesn't make sense to rip all that's existing out and put up three rows of evergreens that are going to be four to six feet high. You're going to lose that, that visuality from the street that you're currently getting as shown by the exhibit that you've seen before or looking out of your car. You can't see behind the existing hedgerows. There's a passage in the scenic corridor ordinance, and I'm just pulling. Talks about the existing hedgerows. Also, anything that is newly planted is going to take a while to fill in, uh, to rise to an acceptable height, unlike what is there now. And I think that by using what is there now, augmenting it where needed, you, I think it's going to be a lot more effective than ripping down what's there and redoing it. So um, here we go, landscape clearing and planting. I'm in uh, section 112-201, the scenic corridor district overlay. Under section 5, landscape and clearing and planting, item A. The preservation of existing hedgerows, both along scenic roadways and in other areas, is essential to the continuing aesthetic quality of the scenic corridor. So preserving those hedgerows, I think, is of primary importance to the scenic corridor district. And we are doing that. And we are going to augment it where it is sparse, as Mr. Shepard has pointed out. Sometimes it's not great, but where it's not great, the applicant's intention is to fill it in and make it better. Any other questions? Okay, we'll open to the public. Anybody who would like to ask the planner questions based on his testimony. Good evening, Mr. O'Brien. Just one question. Um, yes, good evening. We, we've met before. How are you doing? Good, how are you? Um, is it your testimony that there is sufficient evidence and testimony that's been provided in this hearing that the dome that's going to be illuminated and is 51.4 feet high is not visible from anywhere on the, the scenic corridor. Uh, relying on the exhibit that the engineer testified to, yes. Which shows one point of view close to the site itself, but really doesn't give you the view from anywhere else on South Middlebush. Okay. So is it fair to say that we, we don't know whether it's visible or not, particularly at night? when it's going to be eliminated, we don't know whether that dome would or would not be visible from some other point further down on South Middlebush. Is that fair, fair to say? I think it's fair to say that a light in darkness, and this is a dark area, it's an agricultural area, uh, is going to be visible at night at some point, much like when you, when you drive down the street now and you can see somebody's porch light on, you know, as you're driving down a street. You're going to be able to see it to a degree, but is it going to stand out if you're at a distance? No, it'll just be a blink of light. Um, so I think the important question is, will it be visible at the scenic corridor, which is what the township has placed emphasis on? And I think we've demonstrated that it will not be. When you say scenic corridor, I mean, what, what scope of South Middlebush are we talking about? Uh, the area in the immediate vicinity of the application. Could you put a, a, you know, a perimeter on that? No. A diameter. Yes. So it could it could be more than the 500 feet perimeter that um, Mr. Patel indicated in, in his exhibit that we saw earlier. We but haven't done any studies along those lines. Okay. Um, and and the basis of your conclusion that an eliminated dome in an agricultural district is compatible with the scenic corridor criteria, if you could, for my benefit, just state again, how do you reconcile that image with the scenic corridor criteria? The lack of visibility from the scenic corridor uh, adjacent to the site. And you're not defining what adjacent to the site is in terms of any distance? No, I would leave that to the engineers. I don't think that's quite within my scope. Okay, is that something that, that the engineer, it, it's, it's really a legal question, it's a planning question, I think, because You're the asking ordinance, for measurements. Um, 
Yes, but if you read the, the scenic corridor criteria, it talks about panoramic vistas of natural built environments, yeah. um, extended unobstructed view sheds, um, mature woodlands, fallow open fields, um, areas that are visible from the scenic roadways as identified in the ta township master plan. The light is allowed. Light, uh, we're not here for relief on the light. So it's allowed by this board, it's allowed by the township. Okay. But the design of the dome itself is... is We're not here for relief on that either. No, but I'm, I'm asking you about the consistency with the scenic corridor criteria right. of the design as well as the height and the illumination of the dome. Both of which are in conformance. Okay, I have nothing further. Thank you. Okay, anybody else? Then we'll close to the public. I think we have reached that point. Uh, any, well, I guess we would have to uh, give the public the opportunity to make a general comment before we go into any further discussion. So this testimony portion of the hearings are over. If there's anyone out there who would like to make a statement concerning this application, this is the time to do it. Are we uh, are we uh, going to do anything, Ms. Miley? Or thank you, Chairman Thomas. I, I was just going to reiterate some of the conditions that that we discussed. I think it would be helpful to the board, um, and for my peace of mind, for my client's peace of mind, I would just like to um, reiterate my understanding of what I think was discussed and hopefully agreed to. Maybe add a, a couple of others, and just in closing, I would say. Um, the Snyders are probably the residents that are most impacted. I think I can say that safely. Um, while most people, I think everybody in this room, you know, can go home and, and don't live next to the proposed temple, the Snyders live there year round. Not only do they live there, but they run a farm across the street. Um, so they're impacted from all sides. Um, they don't want to give this applicant a hard time. They're not beating up on religion. This is really not about the proposed use. It's really about one thing, and it's, it, it, it's what I've said before, and it, it's what I asked Mr. O'Brien about, which is how it is that you can reconcile the height of this building, the fact that it has a dome that's going to be illuminated. Um, we, we just don't think that that's compatible with the scenic corridor criteria. It's not clear to us what the purpose of having a dome that high is. But nevertheless, um, among the conditions um, was that the applicant would agree to not eliminate the dome during the weekday services and only on special occasions and on the weekends, and that the dome elimination would be shut off after those events. Um, additionally, um, we talked about my clients this night as being at least apprised of um, revised landscaping and the proposed um, enhancement to the buffering, um, particularly the buffering along the south and the southwest property lines, which m most directly impacts them. And as, as it, it, the current state of affairs and the buffering there is really not sufficient to completely shield the, the view which of, of this massive structure that's going to be a, a couple of hundred feet away. Um, Given that proximity, my clients, I think, are entitled um, to at least to be acknowledged in the plans for, for revised landscaping. Um, and I would ask that they be included in those discussions and at least be uh, permitted to weigh in on what might be sufficient um, to protect their interests as well. Um, we talked about the lighting being shut off. Um, the applicant agreed to, to shut off any exterior lighting that 
with the proviso that the security lighting would, would continue. We understand that's required. No loud, loud speakers or amplified sounds outside of the building. Um, we would ask that parking be permitted only on the asphalt parking lot. Um, the applicant agreed and testified that there would be no outside events. Um, we would ask for one other element, and I should have raised this earlier, um, which was whether the applicant might consider altering the color of the exterior, which is something that we, we discussed in, in a similar application, and maybe would consider more earth tones, which would be more compatible with the scenic corridor. That's something I would ask the, the applicant to, continue, to consider and, and, and agree to, if they might. Um, Finally, uh, one other item, which is that there's an existing um, access easement um, that, that goes from, cr crosses this site from South Middle Bush and connects to Lot 7. That happens to benefit Ray Snyder's property. That's an existing easement. I believe it's an easement of record. I would just ask that that be acknowledged, that that, that, that access be preserved and, and not hindered. And that's all I have. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Anyone else wish to speak? All right, now we are closed to the public. Anyone have anything up here to say, or I will hand the uh, hand it over to Mr. Lanford for his summation. Just, just very briefly, uh, most of the comments raised by Ms. Bailey concerning loudspeakers, outside activities, were all agreed to at the previous hearing. Uh, just, just two points. The color of the building, uh, you heard the testimony of why the color was selected. Uh, we do not intend to change the color of the building, uh, nor do we intend to do anything with the dome. Uh, the scenic corridor ordinance doesn't mean that you have to absolutely make the building invisible. There's nothing in the ordinance that says that. What we have done, and I, and I think if you looked at the drawings uh, and, and saw that we have the building basically 733 feet from the road, the dome being further set back from that, uh, as testified to by our engineer, it is practically impossible to see it unless you're standing there looking for it. And, and I don't think I've ever seen a person standing on South Middle Bush Road. And not get hit. And not get hit, yeah. So I, I think w we learned something from the prior application, and I think we have addressed the scenic corridor ordinance. Uh, the other comment, again, we have no problem with Ms. Bailey communicating or Mr. Snyder communicating with uh, Mr. Healy to provide additional uh, buffering where it is necessary. However, Ms. Bailey made the comment that we need to completely shield the building from the Snyder property. There is no requirement that we completely shield the building. We will provide landscaping and buffering, but to say that we would agree to completely shield the building is not a requirement of your ordinance. It is not a requirement of any house of worship. Something will be seen. Uh, it's a building but we will do what we can to screen it as best as we can through the landscaping that we have provided, through the existing vegetation, and through additional landscaping. But I, I don't think you can ask this applicant to completely shield the building. Uh, having said that, regarding the application, it's a fairly straightforward application. The variances that we are seeking are minimal and justified by Mr. O'Brien's testimony to really protect the scenic corridor and to protect the uh, Snyder property. Uh, what we did was put the parking lot further away from his house and, and on the side of our building so they do not see it. And if we put the parking in the back of the building, uh, that would have more of an impact on, Sny on Mr. Snyder and the building would have a more of an impact on the scenic corridor. Uh, again, the width of the driveway aisle is a, a de minimis deviation and also something that makes sense from a stormwater management and impervious coverage issue. So I, I think what this applicant has done uh, is learn from the previous application. What we've given you is about as clean a site plan you, as you can get for a house of worship uh, and we would respectfully request that the 
board grant the D3 variance, the, the C variances, and the site plan approval. Okay, thank you. All right, board members, any comments? Uh, Mr. Chairman, just a few questions, um, some housekeeping. So, Mr. Lanford, the just remind me and the board that the, the issue of the the color of the building. What what? I mean, it, this, the scenic corridor ordinance does suggest the use of earth tone colors. Is there a um, religious expression uh, involved in the color of the building that that prohibits them or, or discourages them from doing earth tone colors? Well, Mr. Shevardkula testified that this was a replica of the temple in India from the region uh, that uh, the people of this religion come from, and we were trying to replicate it. Now, the Sina Carter also says, you know, y you, you would try to uh, recommend that you try to use earth, earth tone colors, but based on the testimony, you're not going to see the building. So I, I think there are reasons why we want to keep the color the way we propose it, and I think the way we designed the building, uh, as you're driving down the road, you just see that one narrow portion of the front of the building, if you see anything at all. And based on Mr. Patel's testimony uh, and even Mr. Joshi's testimony, the, the building is not going to be visible from the scenic corridor. And, and if you looked at the also the uh, height of the dome, it is going to be screened off and maybe you will see a little bit of light, uh, but that's about it. So I, I think that what we have done is protect the intent of the scenic corridor uh, and I don't think changing the color would give any benefit to the scenic corridor because the building's not going to be visible. And then a similar question for the dome. If I recall correctly, there was a reason for its placement, I believe it's over the statue, and that's correct. That also, I mean, this is somewhat similar to a, the same expression as a, as a steeple on a Christian that, church. That yeah, it, it has religious significance. It's placed over the idol, and again, it's set back from. It, it's not near the front of the building, but set back uh, in the building over where the uh, prayer area is. Um, Ms. Bailey mentioned an access easement. Um, I think maybe because this, this application came in a few years ago, um, maybe I knew about that issue and forgot about it. What, 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 what is that regarding? I don't know if there's an access easement, to be honest with you. If there is, obviously we have to adhere to the access easement. Um, and maybe it's probably with Ms. Dolan's uh, traffic report. Now, I... <laughs> Again, uh, basically, if, they, if there is some right, yeah. you have to maintain that right. That is correct. Okay. And I, I do not have a title report uh, with me this evening, uh, so I can't tell you if there is an access easement, but assuming there is, we have to honor it. Okay. G getting a, a little, real quickly, a little deeply into the Santa Quarter Ordinance, it also says that the signage needs to be earth tone. Is, is, I don't recall what the testimony was about the color of the sign. Has we we can make that earth, earth okay. tone. And then there's also some, again, some details of the scenic quarter ordinance, such as making the landscaping native to the extent that you can. I assume that <laughs> you'd be willing to look at the landscaping plan and make it as compliant as possible to the scenic quarter ordinance? That is correct. Okay. And then the last question was, early on in, in the meeting, we talked about um, um, having some order of magnitude commitment on the part of the applicant in terms of the number of trees that could be used to fill in the gaps? Do you have, a, have you had a chance to talk to your client and I, offer a suggestion? I have, I have a, a number in mind that I think I'm going to put in my, my um, uh, proposed uh, variance. Uh, and lastly, I'll just say just generally, I, I, I do agree uh, with, with Mr. O'Brien. I think in general, the approach that's proposed in terms of keeping the existing hedgerow and supplementing with new trees is, def is, is certainly the way to go. It's, I think it's more consistent with the Scenic Corridor Ordinance. He, he cited it correctly that keeping that hedgerow is, is important to um, the Scenic Corridor Ordinance. Um, and again, in terms of both that and in terms of the 
uh, conditional use standards of uh, uh, applicable to places of worship, I think, again, piggybacking on what the screening that's already there, supplementing it with new, makes a lot more sense than taking down a hedgerow and putting a triple staggered row of new trees. Any other questions or comments? We would entertain a motion then. All right. Um, I move that uh, we grant uh, Sadata Mandir Inc. Uh, the variances uh, needed for them to erect uh, the um, uh, the temple uh, that they have proposed, and also to approve uh, the site plan uh, that they have submitted. Uh, subject to the following um, uh, conditions. Uh, first of all, with regard to landscaping, um, the uh, um, the uh, the town will uh, work with um, uh, the uh, uh, current uh, neighbors of the uh, property to uh, make sure that the um, that the landscaping uh, provided by the applicant uh, provides uh, sufficient um, uh, buffering from the uh, proposed um, uh, temple, um, and that um, the uh, the <clears throat> the applicant will uh, install um, an additional 50 trees, up to an additional 50 trees. If the uh, town, uh, in con in consultation with the um, uh, the owners of the adjoining property, um, uh, decide that uh, additional trees are required to make the buffering complete. Um, second of all, with regard to lighting, um, uh, lighting in the parking lot uh, and on the building, except for emergency lights will only be on uh, at night when activities are in progress. Uh, the dome uh, will not be lit during the week, but will be lit on the weekends or when there are special uh, high holy days. And again, at the end of uh, the evening, uh, those lights will be extinguished as well. Um, the kitchen that is being um, created uh, will uh, be used only for food warming, and that no uh, actual cooking of food will go there, will take place in that kitchen or on the premises. Uh, with regard to parking, uh, parking shall be permitted only on the 195 uh, stalls that are provided uh, by the applicant, and um, no other place on the uh, property shall be uh, uh, committed as a place for people to park cars. In addition, uh, people will, uh, the applicant will not allow uh, people to park on South Middlebush Road. I think that that would be a mistake, you know, without question, so. 201, we can correct that, can't we? Okay, <laughs> okay good. <clears throat> okay, um, the um, the sign at the entrance to the building will be painted in earth, earth tones. Uh, there will be no uh, outside activities, and there will be no loudspeakers or amplification. And um, that's all I have. I if have, anybody has uh, anything else to add? Yes, I have a friendly amendment. Sure. Um, we, we talked about police during the High Holy Days, yes. the, the right. uh, Let's high add volume. that. Oh, and um, we need to make some provision for EV charging. Um, yes, I think that, that that covers everything, right? Yeah, I think that covers everything. Okay, do, do we have a second? A second. Is there any further discussion? All the board. General Vithia? Yes. Richard Prokranik? Yes. Joel Reese? Yes. Alan Rich? Yes. Gary Rosenthal? 
Yes. Robert Shepard? You know, G Gary just gave the same reluctant yes that I'm going to give. Um, it does seem a little bit out of character for uh, the scenic byway of South Middlebush Road to have uh, a building of this size with and height with a dome in the top of it. Uh, but uh, when you realize that the building is going to be more than two football fields from South Middlebush Road, and I think the um, the effort that people are going to make and have made with the way that they've situated the building, um, I think that uh, that we have learned a lot since the first uh, the first temple was done. So I'm going to vote yes as well. And Chairman Thomas, I'll vote yes. I agree with uh, the comments that have been made and. We learned so much that we reduced this from 13 months to three meetings. So I think that's progress. Mm -hmm. Anyway, good luck with the facility. Yeah. Thank, you. Thank you very much. Is anybody uh, willing to adjourn? I move to, that we adjourn. Second. I know you're all in favor.